Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We have learned the name of three more students killed in the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde this past Tuesday. Nevea Bravo, Alexandria Rubio, and Tess Mata. That leaves five of the 19 children still unidentified. We also learned today that the husband of Irma Garcia, one of the teachers killed, has also now died. The family of Joe Garcia says that he died of grief after his wife's murder. Now we also know that the shooter shot his own grandmother before going into Robb Elementary. We know that that woman here is here in San Antonio being treated at University Hospital. We're told that she remains in serious condition. Also in serious condition, a 10 year old girl. Two other girls who are nine and 10 years old are in good condition. A quote, where will I put my AK-47? Those are the words a teacher says they overheard from a Seguin High School student that ultimately led to his arrest. A slew of campus threats are happening across the state. And just yesterday, that Seguin High School student was charged for making a terroristic threat. Camelia Juarez is in Seguin with that story. No time is a good time for a student to mention or have conversations about bringing a firearm to a school. Uh, that's escalated 100 times right now. At the end of school yesterday, Seguin ISD announced backpacks would no longer be allowed on campus. A teacher says he overheard 19-year-old Joel Placencia say he wouldn't be able to carry his AK-47, according to the Seguin ISD communications official Sean Hoffman. Seguin police officer Sarah Wallace says a statement like that led to a terroristic threat charge. The fact that he can continuing to make these statements and then when he was questioned about it he also said yes I made them uh, it, it all added together of you know this isn't something to joke about this is something we're going to take very seriously as the investigation continued Placencia was arrested at his home late last night no gun was located and police say Hoffman says he did not have any intention of shooting the school Although there is currently no threat to Seguin High, Officer Wallace says the department has not let their guard down, making 59 visits to the campus in the last 24 hours. Anytime an officer gets freed up from a call and isn't currently dispatched to a call, they're at the school. And one thing I cannot emphasize enough is we're not at the school just because our supervisors told us to. We're at the school because we care about these students. Placencia is not alone in students under investigation for concerning comments. Donna I ISD near the valley was shut down for the rest of the week as they investigate a threatening comment. And closer to home, both Manor ISD near Austin and Northside ISD in San Antonio are investigating a threatening social media post. So far, no other students have been arrested, but as we learn more, we'll let you know. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. There is anger, disbelief, and questions that need to be answered after confirmation today that it took law enforcement nearly an hour to stop the shooter at Robb Elementary. That information coming today during a news conference held by the Texas Department of Public Safety. John Paul Barajas is live in Uvalde. John Paul was at that briefing. John Paul, what can you tell us? Steve, Myra, we're told that the shooter crashed near Robb Elementary, and as he was getting out of the vehicle, he actually fired shots at witnesses just across the street as he was making his way into the school. And we're also told that Uvalde police, as well as district officers, followed him into those very doors just four minutes after he made entry, but were then forced back out because of the gunman's overpowering gunfire. Those officers then called for backup, uh, more resources, body armor, long rifles and negotiators. Eventually, about an hour after the gunman walked into the school, a tactical border patrol team with Uvalde authorities went in and were able to kill him. As this unfolded, there were reports of parents urging officials to make entry sooner. The Texas Department of Public Safety could not confirm that, but one woman who was on scene that day did. Did you hear any parents urging them to go in? Yes. What did you hear from parents? They're mad. Now, she also said that those officers took bullets and did everything that they could and that they were there within minutes. She said that they did do their jobs, even though that 
parents were visibly upset and trying to urge them to go in to save those young innocent children. DPS officials add uh, right now it appears the door the shooter used to get in was unlocked and they wanted to clarify that the shooter never encountered any officers as he made his way in. There was reports that he was encountered by a district officer or officers. They said that at this point is false. He was in there without incident. Um, and then, of course, they had to call in backup. Uh, DPS regional director adds the shooter's grandmother, uh, despite being shot in the face, is still alive and in stable condition and that they are still in the very early stages of this investigation. They have uh, lots of authorities responding to this, lots of interviews to do and lots of interviews to review to try to piece all of this together. Together. And you, Valdi, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Yeah, a lot of questions that have to be answered. Thank you, John Paul. The National Rifle Association scheduled convention this weekend is still going on as planned, but now city officials in Houston are expecting protests following the mass shooting in Uvalde. The NRA convention was already scheduled before the murders of those children and teachers on Tuesday. But the timing now has some feeling angry. City leaders there in Houston say they can't cancel this convention. They have a binding contract with the NRA. That has sparked some organizations to plan protests outside of the convention center. We find it unfathomable that, that these folks are still willing to, to celebrate gun culture, maybe not cancel it, but at least postpone it to a later time where this is not so fresh in people's memories. The NRA did release a statement offering sympathy and to the families and victims in Uvalde. That statement says in part, quote, although an investigation is underway and facts are still emerging, we recognize this was the act of a lone deranged criminal as we gather in Houston, we will reflect on these events, pray for the victims, recognize our patriotic members, and pledge to redouble our commitment to make schools secure. New at six support pouring in to help ease the burden of the families whose loved ones were killed. In Lacoste, a flower shop coordinating with flower farms and wholesalers in the area and around the world to provide free flowers for all the upcoming funerals. Ours flower shop has already begun to receive shipments of flowers, but they say they still need help to get the job done. Alicia Barrera has more on the money needed. Right. Veronica Berger thinks about the little faces that frequently walk into her flower shop in Lacoste. I know the 10 year olds that come in here. The ones that come and pick flowers for their parents for Mother's Day, the ones that we made bouquets for for kinder graduation, the ones we made flowers for to go to the ho hospital when they were born. Which is why she's helping with free flowers, volunteers, and planning with designers and delivery trucks to help the two local flower shops in Uvalde as they prepare to lay the 21 victims to rest in the coming days. Everybody in Uvalde, our hearts go out to them and everybody needs beautiful casket spray. Whatever colors that they pick, whatever they want, if they want special things on there like their baseball gloves or anything that made them who they are, uh, we're gonna get those casket sprays absolutely done for them. And they're getting support from all over the world. Wholesalers are sending flowers from Mexico, Ecuador, Holland, and it's expected that by Monday, this room will be full. Still, monetary donations are needed. We have to pay for the gas, we have to get the supplies to make the easels, to make the casket sprays and everything else that you can only get from wholesale places. Details on how to donate to ours flower shop can be found on ksat.com. Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Just two days after the mass shooting in Uvalde, video of what appears to be a car burglar carrying a rifle has a northwest Bear County neighborhood feeling uneasy. A resident on Shanefield Court, that's near Shanefield in Loop 1604, captured this video overnight on a security camera. Now here you can see two people, which the Bear County Sheriff's Office says appear to be juveniles. They can be seen going from driveway to driveway, appearing to try to find unlocked cars. One of them with what looks like an AK style rifle in his hand. It's ridiculous, you know, just why would you need something that big just to, you know, break into a vehicle? You know, to me, my opinion is that's like cause for harm right there. A sheriff's deputy told case that it appears that the same crew, including two vehicles in the background, tried several blocks in the neighborhood, getting into at least three cars. A spokeswoman told KSAT this afternoon that no one was in custody yet. 
A Bear County deputy facing charges accused of attacking and punching an inmate. 31 year old Ivan Torres charged with official oppression and assault. The assault allegedly happened yesterday. According to Sheriff Javier Salazar, the inmate says Torres punched the inmate Torres punched had been in jail for just one day. Torres had reportedly ordered the inmate to return to his bunk, but the man refused and Torres punched him. The arrest warrant obtained by the defenders states that the inmate hit his face on the corner of a metal bunk, hit the back of his head on another bunk and then landed on the floor. We're told Torres admitted to investigators that he had hit the inmate with a closed fist. Bond for Torres has been set at $20,000. The case of a man who terrorized the medical center area finally coming to an end this week. Anton Harris was sentenced on a remaining aggravated sexual assault case. He was dubbed the medical center rapist. Erica Hernandez reports that before he was taken away for the last time in Bear County, one of his victims faced him in court. Today I'm making you a different promise and this one I intend to keep. I promise to tell my story. The woman whose identity we are not showing because she is a sexual assault victim was able to face Anton Harris five years after he attacked her. Harris, who was 18 at the time of his arrest, is responsible for a series of robberies and rapes of women in the medical center area for almost two years. In early 2020, a jury convicted Harris on one of five aggravated sexual assault charges, and he was sentenced to 99 years. This week, Harris pled guilty to another count in exchange for 35 years and the dismissal of the rest of his cases. The woman in court reminding Harris about the last time he saw her and how he threatened to kill her if she called the cops. Shut up or I'll kill you. Those were your words to me. You used that gun to silence me as so many other rape victims have been silenced. But I will keep this new promise to you. I will not shut up. I will never again be silenced. Now this brings an end to a case that we've extensively covered since 2016. Harris's 35 year sentence will run concurrently with his 99 year sentence and he'll have to serve half of that before he's eligible for parole. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Check out the traffic situation right now. Let's go to 410 and McCullough where it looks like a car is being towed from the inside lanes there. Again, this is overlooking 410 at McCullough and you can see Looks like that car should be towed away momentarily. Plenty of sunshine from that view and this one as well. 95 degrees out there right now. Adam, what are we in for today? Well, you know, we actually had a cool morning. It was very refreshing outside this morning, unseasonably cool. We started the day at 59 degrees here in San Antonio and parts of the hill country even briefly dipped into the upper 40s, but we were 10 degrees below average and just five degrees shy of the record low. Meanwhile, this afternoon, we went well above average up to 96 the high, and that was just four degrees shy of the record high. For the most part, we were well into the 90s for high temperatures today. Right now, we're at 94, dropping to about 90 degrees at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, mid 80s. And then tomorrow morning, we'll start the day in the upper 60s, so a seasonable start to the day. We need some rain. We have the newest drought monitor in. We're going to talk about that and what part of our area really has the most improvement over the past few weeks, along with cranking up the heat a bit for the weekend. We'll talk about how hot in just a bit. I'm Stephanie Jimenez and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Policies and procedures now being called into question as we learn more about how law enforcement responded to the school shooting in Uvalde. We're asking how officers in Bear County would respond during an active shooter situation. That's something that we're going to look at tonight on the night beat. We'll see you at 10. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, a lot of questions about the protocols and the policies that were carried out in Uvalde. Good question about refreshing our memories on what the policies and protocols are in San Antonio and Bear mm -hmm. County. Yes. Uh, 95 degrees out there, though. Heat is back. Adam, it's going to be with us for a while, I'm guessing. Yes, it's back to reality. We had a stretch of about four days in a row of near to even below average temperatures, but still this May is going to shape up to be the hottest May on record. All right, let's take a look at our high temperatures coming down the pike here. Tomorrow about 97, 98 the high Saturday and Sunday Memorial Day about 95. The reason we trim off a few degrees Memorial Day for one reason is we'll have those low morning clouds sticking around for a little longer into the late morning, maybe even midday hours. But 
but we will be shy of record breaking territory, whereas a week ago, you know, we were breaking records left and right. Of course, we need some rain. Don't get me wrong. It was nice to have some showers earlier this week and even uh, over parts of the weekend for some folks. But take a look at this and I want to point out one area in particular, actually a couple. This is the percent of normal precipitation over the past 30 days. So for example, Del Rio has had 131% of their normal precipitation over the past 30 day period. Catula, 113%, so they've been above average. And that's what I want to point out. Down near Catula, Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties, that's where we've had the most significant improvement in the drought monitor. Just a few weeks ago, this orange area down near Catula was in the exceptional category, which is the worst category. Now been upgraded to the severe category, so at least a few categories better. But that's where we've had most of the improvement from Carrizo Springs to Catula, Dilly, over toward Tilden. So that's at least some good news in terms of the drought situation. Of course, we still have this area of drought, Hill Country, parts of Highway 90, Hondo, Sabinal, Uvalde, Northward, Lakey, Kerrville, uh, most of Kerr County, Bandera County, Rial County, and even stretching into Kendall County, Sister Dale and Comfort even northern Atascosa County for that exceptional drought. But I do want to point out this does not take into account the rainfall that we had Tuesday night. It happened a little too late for the cutoff time in order to be analyzed for the drought monitor. So next week's may be a little bit better for some folks. We'll wait and see. Otherwise, a quiet day across Texas today. Of course, nothing but sunshine, blue skies, big wound up system here moving through the midsection of the country. This is the same system associated with the cold front that hit us Tuesday night, giving us the much needed thunderstorms and some strong to severe storms. Now that moisture is all pushing toward the East Coast and even another system dropping into the Pacific Northwest. It's going to linger around through this weekend, but staying too far away from us to give us any good moisture. Actually, here's a look at what we're expecting in terms of moisture here over the days ahead. And for the most part, by and large, the moisture is kept out of our area. That said, yes, we could squeeze in a few shower, a few showers or a brief thunderstorm at some point next week, but the bulk of the moisture is kept out of our area. All right, let's talk temperatures. 91 in Alpine down, 93 Austin, 95 in Abilene. We're not talking triple digits, so that's a bonus at least. And 97 Catula and Pleasanton, and then 92 in Kerrville and Fredericksburg. So we're feeling the warmth creep back in kind of like what we've had most of this month divine even up to 101 port SA at 94 degrees and even officially in town we're at 94 now tomorrow morning we start the day in the upper 60s so back to average and reality for this time of year we had the unseasonably cool conditions today those usually don't last very long this time of year and this is no exception to that rule by tomorrow afternoon, well into the 90s. We're talking 97 Castroville, Seguin, Nixon, Smiley, 96, Pleasanton up to 99, even close to 100 along the Rio Grande. I think around San Antonio, we'll start the day at 68 degrees, nothing but sunshine, a little bit of a breeze by the noon hour at 90, then a high temperature of 97 in town here, total sunshine just like today, and a south southeasterly wind at only 5 to 10 miles per hour. Nice thing is dew points are going to fall off during the day tomorrow, so we're not going to be dealing with any big heat indices. It's really not going to feel like it's much warmer than the actual air temperature. Upper 90s this upcoming weekend. One saving grace here is a bit of a wind you'll notice gusting to 30 miles per hour Sunday, Memorial Day and Tuesday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, I think every cowboy will tell you they want their postseason luck to change, oh, but yes. some cowboys are changing more than that. Yes, uh, Demarcus Lawrence, reporters noticed that he looked much thinner in better shape, and it's really his first true offseason because usually he's recovering from an injury. Well, he also has a new look this year as well, and I'm just talking about his slimmed up body. We got that coming up. Plus, Edison High School had two student athletes sign up for the next level coming up. your mentality heading into the season tank? Become the stat leader again. I let a rookie, uh, you know, show me up last year. Uh, shout out to my boy, Micah. Tank wants his sack title back after Micah Parsons led the boys last season with 13 of them in big board sports.
Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys defensive end, Demarcus Lawrence, is entering his ninth season in the NFL, all spent with the Cowboys. He has 48 and a half career sacks, but only had three last season because he missed 10 games due to injury. Lawrence entered, organized team activities in great shape and with a new look. You know, I had my fun with my dress. Um, you know, it was a growing stage that I was going through. Um, you know, I started growing them when I entered the NFL, and you know, I mean, they grew so fast on me, uh, they got heavy. Mm -hmm. So uh, this year, you know, I, I'm t I turned 30 this year, so I'm like, yeah, it's time for me to make a, you know, a grown man change, and you know, I chopped them off. DeMarcus also said this offseason has been one of the more serious ones for him, and that he's in better shape. Houston Texans second-year quarterback Davis Mills is the big dog at OTAs. That wasn't the case last season because of veteran QB Tyrod Taylor. Mills gained significant experience last season, starting 11 games for the Texans as a rookie, and the team appears to be happy rolling into the new season with him as their starter. Wideout Brandon Cooks was asked what kind of growth has he seen out of Mills. I just think his uh, his leadership, you know, his confidence, just really taking control of that huddle. You know, he's not that rookie anymore. He's coming in. He knows that's his huddle, um, and, and that's what you look in for your quarterback, and he's definitely doing that. Head coach Levy Smith said he thinks Mills is going to be an excellent quarterback in the NFL. Earlier this week, two young men from Edison High School signed their national letter of intent to continue their education and athletic careers at the next level. And Brian Gonzalez is going to Wayland Baptist University to play baseball. His mom, dad, and younger brother and sister were by his side when he put pen to paper. Brandon is undecided when it comes to his major, but he does know the baseball program at Wayland Baptist is just what he needs. I really like the hard nose coaching. The coach is uh, new. He played for the Mets, actually. He went to the MLB, and um, he's a pitching coach as well. And I'm going to go to play pitcher and also infield. And uh, just I feel like I could develop the best under those coaching staff over there. Next up is Riley Garcia, who will attend Kansas Wesleyan University for track and field. His mother and his cousin Nathan were there for his big day, and we asked him why he picked Wesleyan University. I'm going there because they not only have high standards for the sports, but also high standards for the academic program in which I'm trying to pursue, which is sports management. Both guys played football for Edison and are great examples for the underclassmen. Ellen Nicholas was named the 2021-22 Southland Conference Women's Golfer Student Athlete of the Year. The junior from the University of Incarnate Word completes a sweep of the league's top honors after being named the Southland Women's Golfer of the Year. She capped off an impressive year from Tita Green with a 3.33 GPA in sport management. In the Conference USA Baseball Tournament, UTSA beat Florida Atlantic 6-4 today, so the Roadrunners will now face number one seed Southern Miss tomorrow morning at 10. Love it. Yep. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. The news of this week is weighing so heavily on all of our hearts and all of our minds. A lot of us struggling to come up with the words to describe uh, how we're feeling and what we're what we're thinking about what has happened in Uvalde, especially when it comes to talking to our kids about that. So in today's case at Q&A, we have Dr. Barbara Robles Rama Murphy with UT Health San Antonio, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Doctor, thank you for being here. Um, this this is a really, really difficult week. And I, I, I want just to start this conversation about just that. Where do you start to talk to a child about what they're hearing and what has happened? Yes, I mean, thank you both for having these important conversations. We want to be having these tough conversations on a regular basis, right? Not when, just when tragedy strikes. Um, but certainly it's important that we all learn to have these difficult conversations. In a way, I think it's good that we're all struggling so much to hear these news because these are not normal news. These are not things we want to be seeing on a regular basis. And so I think that's the first step to say that this is a very human response that we're all having. This pain, um, the, the depth of you know, how deep it goes, it shows us that we all care about each other, about life, how sacred life is. And so we can acknowledge that first and then be okay with that pain, learn to feel it and learn to, to navigate it. 
it's just it, it is so difficult because these are things our children are going through that many of us didn't at that age. So I, what do you say? I mean, what do you, how do you, you know, what's, what are tips for talking to either your youngster or your adolescent about what happened, what played out in Uvalde? Yeah, so I've been talking to a lot of journalists and uh, we're happy to share some resources, but basically we start with um, where your child is in terms of developmental stage their ability to process this information and what they have heard already, what they already know. So asking questions, open-ended questions and listening to what they're telling you, observing their behavior, how are they responding? Are they seeming more um, anxious? Are they needing more support, more reassurance, more connection? Um, those could be signs that they're feeling the stress whether or not they know the news that the situation and so understanding what they know already that's where we want to start and then you can based on what they already know you can see what questions they have and how you can support their understanding and answer them little by little uh, allowing them to ask more questions show you that they're processing the information or how they're processing and then you take it from there based on, you know, where they want to take it, how, how deep they want to take that conversation. And I think, you know, it's important that we as adults learn to have re these really tough, painful conversations because when we are feeling the pain, we may not want to talk about it with the little ones, but they're hearing this news. They might be hearing from friends at school or on social media. And so it's important that we open up those spaces for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up social media because it is such an influence, especially on teens and, you know, kids who are of an age where they have their phones in their hands all the time. But I have on social media heard parents say, you know, I want to shield my child from this. I, I don't I don't want to talk to them about it because I don't want them to fear school. Um, and, and I'm just curious in this day and age, like Steve said, this is this is a part of our kids lives. They are going through active shooter drills. These are conversations that they're happen having in school. Do you think there is harm or is it to a child's detriment not to talk to them? about what has happened this week, not to have that conversation. And I'm sure age plays a factor in that too, but I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so with the little ones who may not be exposed to news, radio, TV, or other people outside the home, um, it's definitely you know not necessary for them to know if there's no need for them to hear this news. Uh, but. I do want to remind parents that a lot of times adults do have sensitive conversations around little ones, thinking that they might not understand or maybe listening. But I can tell you, I have a four year old who hears everything I say and he does follow up with questions. And so keep that in mind. Just because you're not talking about it doesn't mean they're not listening to other people talk about it. In terms of shielding our kids from the hard reality that they are living, it's just impossible once they get to school age and and beyond especially once they have a phone and they're accessing social media it's just impossible to shield them from these news um and so i i really strongly um encourage parents to find ways to talk about these hard, hard conversations it's not easy i'm not pretending that it's easy none of us want to have these conversations but throughout time, you know, psychology has taught us that opening up those conversations regarding those difficult topics that are taboo in our culture um, or are difficult, such as, for example, death, uh, sex, drugs, all of these things, we know that parents and families who open up those spaces for kids to learn from trusted sources of information tend to do better than when they try to navigate this information by, by themselves and we don't know where they're getting their information. I know you're a child and uh, adolescent psychiatrist, but for adults, isn't it also important for us to admit that we're not okay 
that this is affecting us, that this is troubling us, what happened in Uvalde? And then and, and, and do we let our kids see that? It is absolutely necessary that we start having these very tough and honest and open conversations as adults because we often don't talk about these things. It's, um, you know, loss, grief, um, hardships, all of these things are part of our human experience and we have to learn how to talk about it. And so it's extremely important. And as a child psychiatrist, I think it's even more important that we learn how to have these difficult conversations when we have kids and when there's kids around us, because educators, right? So anyone who's working with kids need to learn how to process these difficult experiences so that they can know how to talk about it with the young ones, absolutely. It's difficult to know where to start, but the point is just start somewhere. You don't have to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Or have an you explanation. Can lots, you can yeah. do lots of listening and you can learn to just let people express their emotions, their experiences, their opinions without having to guide them all the time. So we can all learn how to do that a little bit better. Um, and by learn by listening, we can learn how to express ourselves as well. Dr. Robles Murphy, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time. We'll be right back. New at six, a series of art thefts has some local gallery owners on edge. San Antonio police looking into several reported thefts at three different art galleries. RJ Marquez spoke to one of those gallery owners and an artist who had her work stolen. They're confused about why this is happening and say they don't expect to get those pieces back. The thought of having work stolen has never crossed my mind. Robbie Felder says he's taken the art down from his walls after a burglar hit his gallery on North Main Avenue twice this month. Uh, to me, these are taken based on someone's personal taste, and I, I can't find any other way uh, to think about it than that. Along with Felder's gallery, two others, Anarte and Prudencia, have reported similar thefts. So Felder two, shared surveillance three, video with us of a person from. smashing their way into his gallery. They've taken three paintings from one artist. The total value is uh, $32,700 of the artwork that they took. Felder tells us that the first burglary at his art gallery happened on May the 6th when the suspect busted through the side window to get inside. And then just five days later, Felder says he came back and busted through the front door, this time stealing thousands of dollars in art by using a sledgehammer, which he ended up leaving behind. Pat Slocum is a local artist who had two of her pieces stolen at Prudencia's. Uh, it hit me, you know, how much this was going to mean that I might never see the work again. Like Felder, Slocum said she doesn't understand why someone would do this. It doesn't make sense. So, you know, that someone would take that risk for something that wasn't any more expensive than they were. San Antonio police say these thefts are under investigation, but have not said if they are related. Felder said he wanted to get the word out now before the burglar strikes again. My guess would be that other galleries in the area are taking precautions um, as this news starts to get out. Everyone, um, is feels very sorry for the artists who have their work stolen because they know how much the work means to us. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. Lots of sunshine out there and the heat is ramping back up, Adam. Yeah, we're starting to crank it up. Now, earlier this morning, it was actually refreshing and cool. And we were down to 59 for the morning low. That's not going to last, though. Temperatures in general are on the upswing. Right now we're at 94 by 8 o'clock, 86, 10 o'clock, 80 degrees. And then early tomorrow morning, upper 60s, which is average for this time of year. Talk about how hot it's going to get into the upcoming weekend. And in case you missed it yesterday, NOAA's Atlantic Basin 2022 hurricane forecast in just a second. All right, big weekend coming up, Memorial Day, a lot of people with plans. Mm -hmm. That are affected by the weather this time of year. Yes, and if for a second there, I thought you said a lot of people have plants, and that's no. true, they are affected <laughs> well, because... Uh, that's not what I said, but I it know. is true. A lot of people yeah. do have plants. Yeah. A lot, yes. of, lot of hand watering. <laughs> We've had to do that all month, and we're going to continue to have to do that because, I mean, I, I say this from experience, they start to wilt so quickly with the sunshine and our heat. Not as cool tonight as what we had last night. Summer-like heat, it's, it's bad.
back even in the mornings and a bit windy at times. At least there will be some breeze out there periodically, especially for a specific part of the upcoming weekend. In case you missed it yesterday, I want to point this, this out and we do have an article on KSAT.com. The Atlantic hurricane season forecast National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration issued their forecast earlier this week. No surprise above average season 65% chance of an above average season for one warmer than normal sea, surf sea surface temperatures again and the presence of La Nina, which slows down the trade winds and doesn't provide as much wind shear in the waters of or over the waters of the Atlantic. All right, let's talk about our heat, though. We are 6.7 degrees above average for the month of May. Let's see how many record high temperatures we've had. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight record high temperatures so far this month, and that should be all we'll have for the month, but we've been well above average and we are still on track to have the hottest May on record. Now the coolest reading was 59 degrees and that was actually earlier this morning. Right now we're at 94, nothing but sunshine. Dew point of 50, that's the key. So relative humidity is way down. It feels pleasant outside in terms of the lack of humidity and lack of mugginess. And we often see this drop off in the afternoon in the humidity, and we're going to see it again tomorrow. We'll start the day, even later on tonight, increasing mugginess. Tomorrow morning, very muggy to almost oppressive humidity. And then during the heat of the day, bright sunshine as well the dew points fall off. So we're not going to have big heat indices. The heat index is going to be kept in check and really it's going to feel like the actual air temperature out there. Speaking of air temperatures, at least we're not 100 today. Uh, so often this month we've been reporting triple digits on this map, but Pleasanton 97 along with Catula, Eagle Pass at 95, 91 now in Kerrville, and we're mostly just well into the 90s. You know, Stinson Airport always reporting a little bit higher than some surrounding areas, but right now at 97 degrees. Holotus, meanwhile, at 94. Tomorrow morning, upper 60s. That's right near average. That's for most of us. We'll st still be in the mid 60s farther to the north. Bernie, Bulverde, 64 along with Comfort. Meanwhile, 69 Pleasanton, Floresville, 68 and around San Antonio, about 68 the morning temperature by the afternoon, though. We're up into the 90s again. Bulverde, 93, Castroville, 97, and we'll feel the warmth. The active weather. That's all farther to the northeast midsection of the country moving into the east coast and even coming into the Pacific Northwest. That's all going to stay out of our area. We're looking high and dry. Your KSAT 12 hour forecast shows nothing but sunshine tomorrow. 68 in the morning by noon, 90 degrees. Good pool weather tomorrow. 97 then the afternoon high temperature and a south southeasterly wind at only 5 to 10. You'll notice a gustier wind with those highs in the upper 90s near 100 by Sunday in particular, about 30 mile per hour gusts. So that'll provide a bit of relief and that'll be the case all the way through early next week. Oh, you said pool weather. Mm -hmm. mm. You kind of lost me. I got distracted <laughs> right then. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. The man known as the medical center rapist was sentenced for this week after taking a plea deal. Anton Harris is already serving 99 years after being sentenced in 2020 for one of five aggravated sexual assault cases. Harris was a teenager when he was arrested in 2017 for a series of attacks of women in the medical center area. A vigilant teacher overheard a student telling someone he would bring an AK-47 to school. That's what happened at Seguin High towards the end of the day yesterday. The student admitted to administrators he was joking and he had no guns. However, the district and police took those comments seriously. They arrested 19 year old Joel Placencia for making a terroristic threat. In a quiet cul-de-sac off Shanefield Place, Steve Contu's security camera picked this up at around 3.44 a.m. Two people going from driveway to driveway, seemingly looking for unlocked cars. But it's the appearance of what looks to be an AK style rifle in one of their hands that makes the Marine combat vet glad he did not wake up to catch them. Police say they actually found a truck with bullet holes at the scene, but the driver was gone. The other driver and their vehicle had already sped away. Officers don't even know if anyone was hit. 
Investigators are now trying to speak with witnesses. Lake Mead Reservoir is so low that they are finding bodies in barrels from the 70s and 80s. Authorities say they may find more bodies as the lake levels continue to recede. Reason for that droughts are getting longer and worse. How do we fix drought? Conserve water. Really put a lot of thought into that one. That is what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. As we head into the summer months, a lot of people will be firing up that grill and what goes with cooking out beer. But this takes that pairing to a whole new level here. Miller Lite Beer Cold. The company's director of marketing says it's the first ever beer infused charcoal made by reducing the beer down to a concentrate then using it to coat the coals. The product debuted on MillerLightBeerCold.com on Tuesday. At the price of $11.99 for a four pound bag. As of this morning, it was already sold out. The website says there's more on the way. Oh, I don't get that. More on the way, Steve. We'll be waiting in line, huh? Why? I say that why sarcastically. Do I, need coal? Why, I mean, if I'm cooking out, I'm probably drinking a beer anyway, so why do I need it in my coals? These are don't. all excellent. <laughs> you play. Hot. We gotta, we gotta finish this debate. We don't have time. <laughs>